Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for the third session in the Doula and Perinatal Community Health Worker and Medicaid Virtual Learning Series. My name is Yancy Wheeler. I'm the Health Policy and Research Assistant at the Institute for Medicaid Innovation. I would like to begin by thanking our partner, Every Mother Counts, as well as our funder, the Community Health Acceleration Partnership, for their commitment to advancing important perinatal health topics in the Medicaid population. We are able to offer this free learning series because of their generous and ongoing support. This learning series includes eight monthly one hour Zoom sessions. Topics will address relevant policy issues with pre-session materials, supplemental resources, and invited subject matter experts. As a refresher, the link to today's pre-session materials have been placed in the chat. Sessions are recorded and will be archived on the IMI website. All attendees are automatically muted. The chat feature is disabled. However, we have reserved time at the end of the session for you to ask questions for our guest speakers. To participate in the discussion with the speakers, please use the Q&A feature to submit questions and comments. We encourage you to submit questions throughout the session. The questions will be consolidated and shared by the moderator during the Q&A portion of the panel. At the completion of each session, you will receive an email message with a link to complete a short three-minute feedback survey. As a reminder, completion of the survey is required as part of your participation in the learning series. We actively review and incorporate your feedback into, your fu into future sessions. We look forward to hearing your thoughts. Finally, all materials, including the slides and session recording, will be available to everyone on the IMI website about two weeks after the session. Today's learning objectives are to compare and contrast Medicaid program structures for community-based doulas and perinatal community health workers identify essential operational processes and systems for Medicaid programs for community-based doulas and perinatal community health workers, identify strategies for sustainable coverage of perinatal support services, and identify the role of credentialing in state-based Medicaid programs for community-based doulas and perinatal community health workers. So today, before we hear from our speakers for this session of the learning series, I wanna acknowledge the importance of avoiding the temptation to place the burden of addressing all maternal health inequities solely on the shoulders of doulas and perinatal community health workers. As stated in prior sessions, access and coverage to doula and perinatal community health worker services in Medicaid is just one element of a multi-pronged approach that is needed to support system-wide transformation. So without further ado, I'll now pass it to the session's moderator, Nan Strauss, the Managing Director of Policy, Advocacy, and Grant Making for Every Mother Counts to briefly introduce our speakers and panelists. Thank you so much, Yanti, for kicking off today's session. I'm really excited to introduce a wonderful group of panelists today, uh, starting with Iris Bixler, the Senior Traditional Health Worker Liaison, Lane CCO at Pacific Source Health Plans in Oregon. Then we'll have Joni James, the Managed Care Project Coordinator at Health Connect One in New Jersey, and also Sean Vamillion, the Director of Project Management at Health Connect One, also in New Jersey. And finally, uh, Julie Williams, the Operations Coordinator from a company doula care in Massachusetts. We've placed a link to all of our speakers' bios in the chat so we can get right to the content. Each of our speakers is going to start by giving a brief introduction to their work, and then we'll follow with discussing lessons learned from contracting, credentialing, and billing in the states and programs where they have experience working. After these short presentations by the speakers, we'll transition into first a panel discussion, followed by audience questions. So first, with no further ado, we'll be hearing from Iris Bixler. Go ahead, Iris. Thank you so much for having me today. My name is Iris Bixler. I use she, her pronouns. I've been a birth doula for 27 years and currently work to support doula workforce development and contracting for Pacific Source Health Plans. Next slide. Today, I wanna to review uh, with you all Oregon's Medicaid model, identify some of our state's doula workforce challenges, and also highlight a few of our recent successes. Next slide. So first, let's level set on Oregon's model. In 2011, Oregon passed House Bill 3650, which recognized five non-clinical provider types as part of the health system. This bill created the umbrella term traditional health worker, which encompasses several different types of providers, including birth doulas, 
community health workers, a variety of peer support, and personal health navigators. While each have their own special scope of practice, by definition, they are all trusted individuals from their local communities who share lived experience with the people they serve. They connect clients to healthcare and provide referrals to social determinants of health, such as housing and food. While the 2011 legislation developed rules for traditional health worker certification and billing, I wanna be clear that traditional healers have been working all over the world, providing person and community-centered care for centuries. House Bill 3650 didn't create the idea of traditional health workers, rather it developed a pathway for already existing services to bill Medicaid, including birth doulas. Another commonality all types of traditional health workers have is that they provide culturally responsive, linguistically appropriate, trauma-informed, high-quality care to underserved populations. Health plans, state and local governments, schools, clinical providers, and community-based organizations are all beginning to prioritize integrating traditional health workers as part of their strategic health equity plans. I also wanna highlight the unique way Medicaid is administered in Oregon. Our state is broken into 16 Medicaid regions and each region has one or sometimes two health insurance companies that contract with the Oregon Health Authority to administer the Medicaid benefit to people living in that area. These are called Coordinated Care Organizations, or CCOs. Pacific Coast Health Plans, the company I work for, has contracts in four of these CCO regions. Next slide. While legislation might have created a pathway for birth doula Medicaid billing, there are many barriers for the workforce. For example, access to affordable birth doula training is an issue in Oregon. Most trainers charge between $1,000 and $2,500, which for many on limited incomes is simply unattainable. In Oregon, trained doulas are required to attend three live births and three postpartum visits to become eligible for state certification, which is the first of many steps toward Medicaid billing. As you can imagine, attending three births and three postpartum visits requires dozens, if not hundreds of hours, which is all unpaid work. The financial burden of training and certification requirements is a significant barrier, especially for people who are resource limited. This has disproportionately impacted Black, Indigenous, people of color, and immigrant communities, leading to a doula workforce that is largely white, middle class, cisgendered, and English only speaking. I often hear doulas say to me, I'm so confused, I don't even know where to start. Over the course of the past decade, the state has unfortunately developed complicated rules for birth doula certification. Understanding these bureaucratic expectations can be daunting and specific requirements as they relate to a person's professional and educational background can be complicated to figure out. Beyond state certification, the process for contracting and credentialing with a CCO can also come with confusing paperwork. On top of that, the next challenge is learning how to bill, including knowing the correct CPT, diagnosis, and location codes, just to name a few. When Oregon passed birth doula Medicaid legislation, the first reimbursement rate was $75. That included the global episode of two prenatals, support at the birth, and two postpartum. Several years later, the rate increased to $350. However, given expenses such as childcare, liability insurance, and travel expenses, Either with a very real possibility of needing to attend two to three day labors means the doula may end up working significantly less than minimum wage. Next slide. But with big challenges come innovative solutions. State government, CCOs, private foundations, and the doula community are all hearing the call to action. For a third year in the row, for a third year in a row, Pacific Source will be offering scholarships to birth doula trainings, and I'll be outreaching to underserved communities to recruit people to participate. There are also initiatives that will begin to pay newly trained doulas to attend three births and they're required for state certification. Last year, a nonprofit called Nurturely received a three-year state grant to train people from diverse backgrounds to become doulas and provide education and support on how to create a sustainable doula business that serves Medicaid. Another system that, is, that began in 2020, another success, uh, is that CCOs are required to hire a traditional health worker liaison, which I mentioned is my role at Pacific Source. 
Uh, the aim of this position is to liaise between the traditional health worker community and the health system. I offer technical assistance to traditional health workers and ensure my health plan's policies and workflows are aligned and it's working. As of yesterday, Pacific Source has 63 contracted in-network doulas and pending contracts with additional 10. I'm actively supporting 38 people through the pre-contracting work to become doula Medicaid provider. Also want to mention that my organization, that many organizations are developing tools that support this work. For example, the Oregon Doula Association received funding from several CCOs to develop a seven part webinar series that goes step by step through all the necessary processes. These free webinars will be in both English and Spanish and posted on YouTube as well as the Oregon Doula Association website later this spring. Another strategy taking root in our state is the concept of doula hub. The idea is that a group of doulas come together as an LLC, nonprofit, or informal collective to support one another in capacitating one or two doulas within the group that have experience or aptitude for administrative work to support all the doulas in the hub in certifying, contracting, and billing. There is an additional benefit to doula hubs being able to offer culturally specific services opportunities for mentorship and backup support. Lastly, uh, it's, it's with my great pleasure to say that perhaps the greatest accomplishment of the past year is an improved doula reimbursement rate. Thanks to many passionate, dedicated doulas, we, are suc we successfully advocated to the state to increase that $350 rate to a whopping $1,500. When I was in the meeting where the increased rate was announced, I literally fell to the floor and left. It is a game changer. I believe Oregon in 2023, it's the year of the doula. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Iris. Uh, we look forward to hearing more about that process in Oregon during our Q&A. Next, we have the pleasure of hearing from Joni James and Sean Vamillion from Health Connect One. Over to you both. Good morning. My name is Sean Vamily. I'm the Director of Project Management for Health Connect One. Hello. Uh, My name is Joni James and I am the Managed Care Project Coordinator at Health Connect One. Next slide. So over the years, we've learned a few lessons in this work, whether working at the state level to implement a new benefit or with an individual managed care organization. And I like to remind folks of one of my favorite quotes, if you build it, they will come. If you're a movie nerd, you know it comes from Field of Dreams. It seems this is in the attitude of those in power that are building systems for some time now. However, the answers that we've heard from community doulas and perinatal community health workers across the board is that this attitude does not apply. They've continuously said, we will not participate if you build ineffective and inequitable systems. So across the board, I can say, for states and managed care organizations, you won't reach network adequacy if you continue to build systems and structure the benefits in a, in a way that doulas cannot easily enroll um, in processes that are intended solely for them. Next slide. So to continue off that, to build a successful and equitable system, we found that there are three things that need to be addressed. Doulas need support, clear communication and clear processes, and also equitable reimbursement. And we'll continue to expand on these thoughts. Next slide. So what does sustainability look like? Well, the current medical system through data has shown that it's not working for birthing people, but it's inarguable that doulas and the support that they provide are extremely effective. In large part, it's because doulas are able to provide that effective care because they can work outside of the traditional medical model of care. So we need to be mindful of this and not take away their autonomy in our attempt to mold them into the current system. So to build a sustainable system, there's a lot of things involved, but we'd say at a minimum, the process should include three things, conducting an environmental scan and needs assessment, including community-based doulas and perinatal community health workers in a meaningful way when building the infrastructure and providing them resources and ongoing support to, for the workforce credentialing, billing, and the workforce development process, and also 
ensuring that we continue to provide continuing education. Next slide. So when thinking of the environmental scan and needs assessment, it's important that we ask a couple of questions. So how many births are there per year? How many doulas need to service? Um, how many doulas are needed to service those births? Have you polled your community? How many doulas are currently practicing in the target areas? How many births, how many births are doulas taking on on average individually, whether they're full-time or part-time doulas? Are there current work pathways for doulas and perinatal community health workers, not just as independent providers, but are there systems that they can function in after the benefit is live? What's the current pay rate and what service delivery model is being utilized? What trainings have doulas participated in or completed? And what additional resources and supports are needed? And again, it's important to note that doulas are already doing the work, the work that we know and see that increases the breastfeeding initiation rates by 26%, reduces cesareans by 28%. So getting a thorough picture of each of these considerations prior to implementing a new program is crucial. Otherwise, we will effectively change the way doulas are able to operate and function if we build a benefit that doesn't work around them. So we wanna allow the doulas to doula when we're building a new benefit. Next slide. So building the infrastructure. Some key components include forming a work group or advisory board that is diverse and culturally reflective of the target population. We firmly believe at Health Connects One that your community already has the answers. It is rich and diverse but are their voices being represented or heard? When conducting a time study or looking at an existing time study that has already been done, are you adequately looking at what the doula is doing? Yes, doulas are there for um, provide continuous labor support, which can be hours on end. We also call, text, and also commute. So when building um, equitable reimbursement, compensating us for that time is critical to ensure that we have longevity in this field because burnout is a major deterrent. When building uh, credentialing processes, uh, are we looking at the individual and the doula and also acknowledging core components? Yes, this person is interested in advocating for maternal health, but also there is so much more to them as an individual. And with the processes, going back to the other slide about what doulas need, is it clear when filling out the application, do they understand what is needed of them so that they can also complete the application and as quickly as, as possible? And then also, is there a directory or a listing of doulas enrolled as Medicaid providers so that the people in the community can also access them as needed? Next slide. Building resources and support. So doulas are being credentialed, but in the state, we don't want to come in and remake the wheel, so to speak. Are there community-based doula organizations or entities or individuals already doing the work? We can collaborate. Um, and thus this ensures that we are able to not only make a difference, but continue on with the work. Um, these entities can do a myriad of things. So providing education and resources for doulas, serving as a liaison or a stakeholder group for legislative efforts, uh, including the voices of the doulas and other community stakeholders so that it can be heard. Um, and sometimes also, and we'll talk about this later, there are entities that also provide building services um, to support the doula in their credentialing efforts. Next slide. So what are some of the best practices that we've seen? First and foremost, always com include community-based doulas and perinatal community health workers and other community stakeholders when building these pro programs. Partnering with the established agencies and stakeholder groups who are currently, again, as repeating what Joni said, already doing the work and collaborating with them rather than coming in and taking over. Um, when it comes to certifying, focusing on core competencies and an experiential pathway for doula certification, We've seen many states utilize a small list of certifying bodies. And in those states, we constantly see a lack of doulas that are actually able to participate in, those, in a benefit. And those states really probably won't ever reach network adequacy to support the thousands of births that they need. 
One of the best structures that I've seen personally is California and Rhode Island, their certification pathways. These focus on the core competencies rather, rather than utilizing specific certifying bodies, which promotes exclusivity and oftentimes can actually eliminate culturally reflective and inclusive training and focuses on the popular and well-known models. Um, if a state or an MCO is going to insist on utilizing a specific list, allowing that there will be opportunity for innovation. So making a clear and direct pathway for organizations to add their training um, as they create new trainings to be added to the list, make space for, for innovation. Um, also, we wanna make sure that we set reimbursement rates high enough to create sustainable provider capacity. Current rates we've seen range from $150 for labor support and $350 for a total number of visits up to $915,000, which we love the $915,000 rate. And we, you know, just thinking about this as a, an MCO or as a, a state, um, when you, we talk about a doula, you can easily Google, what is a doula? They provide continuous support. That continuous support means I'm there, personally, I'm a doula, I'm there for the entire labor. For $150 for labor support that's gonna last for 18 hours, that's the equivalent of paying me $8 an hour for my time and not giving me mileage to reimburse the travel time, the 20 or 30 miles that I've drawn, driven to the hospital to see that payment. And I, I just want that to sit with you for a minute when you're thinking about creating these reimbursement rates and what they actually mean for the doula. Next slide. Um, and we also want to set for service delivery models that allow for customized and individual support for birthing families. So families being allowed to reallocate their visits um, to get additional visits when they need them in the postpartum in the postpartum period, whether that requires prior authorization or not, um, but making sure that care can be individualized and it's not a hard and fast rule. And we want to continue to reduce the administrative burden um, of doulas. So uh, one example of an application that we've seen um, creating specific doula applications um, with language that can be easily understood. I personally have gone through um, applications and given feedback to a managed care organization and they've told me basically that that's too much. It, that's gonna take too much work in order to change the language. Even though I've let them know continuously, this is a DEI issue. You're recruiting from the same pool of people who are um, recipients of Medicaid. You won't send them out member facing material that's not on a fifth grade reading level, but when you recruit from this dual, this pool and ask them to be providers, you then expect them to be able to navigate an application that's meant for people who have had 10 years of schooling. So thinking about that as well. Next slide. And lastly, we just wanna talk about what the New Jersey Dual Learning Collaborative is. Um, so the, the NJDLC, that's one of the best, best practices that we've seen and uh, you know, big up to New Jersey because they, and it's not just because I'm from New Jersey, but they saw the need in providing an organization um, that really is there for the doulas. So the NJDLC, I like to say, NJDLC doulas the doulas, helps them get through the credentialing process, supporting them with billing and reimbursement, helping them to navigate a brand new system that they've never they had to be involved before um, to be able to support birthing families throughout New Jersey. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joni and Sean Vey. Uh, if there are any questions for the audience, uh, please don't forget to put your questions in the Q&A. Next, we are going to hear from Julie's Williams from Massachusetts from a company doula care. So over to you, Julie's. Thanks so much, Nan. I'm Julie's Williams, as you heard, I'm the operations coordinator for a company doula care. Um, I manage all claim submissions for our company. I also do some of the client tracking and I manage payroll for our team. So I get a front row seat at what really makes a company tick. Um, next slide. So I know that looking at our website was part of the pre-session work, but I did want to give a little bit more information about who a company is. Um, we are a nonprofit based in Massachusetts. We're a team of 23 doulas and six leadership members. 
five leadership team members are doulas and all of our founders are doulas. So we are really for doulas and by doulas here. Um, our team speaks the languages that are most prevalent in our area to serve our clients the best. Um, so our team speaks English, Spanish, Portuguese, Mandarin, Haitian Creole, Cape Verdean Creole, Urdu, Hindi, Bengali, and Albanian. Uh, our model matches clients with doulas who are based in their community, speak their language, and doulas that are culturally competent to, in regard to their client, excuse me. We're proud to say that in 2022, we supported 160 births. So MassHealth, our Medicaid program in Massachusetts, doesn't yet cover doula services, but they will cover doula services in June. Uh, even though MassHealth doesn't cover doula services now, we're able to provide services to certain members of MassHealth through two contracts that we have with two payers in our state. Uh, these payers realized the importance of doula support and they refer their clients with the most need for services to us. We've been in both of these contracts for four years, so we have many ideas about systems and processes to make doula integration smooth, excuse me, a smooth transition for our state. Next slide, please. So our client satisfaction is really high. Um, every time a uh, client has finished their time with us, uh, had their last postpartum appointment, we do send out a client survey and the survey responses are always in the 90th percentile. And I think that the client journey and um, the relationship with the ACOs that we contract with is a big reason for that. So I did just wanna go over the client journey with you. So first the client is identified by the accountable care organization, the ACO, and then the referral is sent from the ACO to a company. Once we receive the referral, our amazing doula supervisor, Luz Lopez, and our outstanding uh, project manager, excuse me, program manager, Diana Hahn, will match the uh, doula to the client um, based on the race and ethnicity, the language they speak, where they live, and the uh, doula's knowledge of the client's culture. Once the uh, client and doula are matched, the relationship begins and the doula reaches out to the client. After services begin, a company meets with the ACO. So this last step is where I believe the magic happens. We meet with the ACOs on a biweekly and monthly basis, and we're able to ask the ACO to manage medical referrals if necessary. So this takes the client out of having to do more legwork to get different appointments. Um, and then we also share information. So if there are any so, excuse me, social determinants of health that the client is facing, everyone is made aware so that we can pool our resources and help the client. <clears throat> this is person-focused care and it's closing the gap between the client and the payer. And that's a big key to our success. Next slide. So when our team is speaking our own systems, negotiating contracts, and just in conversation about where we can grow, we like to put in the forefront and remember that we're not fitting doulas and doula services into the way that we've done things in the past. We're integrating a new type of provider that requires a new system. So I wanted to go over some solutions for the future. So the first one is easily accessible virtual training and information that's optimized for mobile devices. So when doulas are integrated and credentialed and ready to begin accepting services, there should be training that's always available for them to learn about claims processes, the claims journey, and how to understand and appeal denials. Uh, the information should be virtual and optimized for Android and iOS. And I would love to see if there were live Zoom sessions based on the trainings for face-to-face -face questions um, and more in-depth info. Next, payment for services, or excuse me, payment for each and every part of a service. So it's important to highlight that doula work does not stop at appointments and births. It's a 24-7 position. So at a company, our doulas are paid for the amount of time that it takes to document their visits. They're paid for 
a parking fee for when they attend a birth at the hospital. And I would like to see both of these things taken into consideration when we're deciding the reimbursement rate for Massachusetts doulas. Along with uh, pay for appointments and births, our doulas are also receiving payment for any contact that they have with their clients via text and call. We call these contacts interactions. Um, last year, our doulas had 2,655 interactions. That's an average of about 115 interactions per doula. So if doulas are not paid for this time, that's 115 times that they worked for free. Next, um, claim, a claims clearinghouse with capabilities for direct phone contact for doulas. So individual doulas and newly affiliated groups may have little to no administrative help and um, they may not have experience submitting claims or even communica communicating with a payer in the provider role. So it would be ideal if there was a clearinghouse um, that was contracted by Medicaid agencies for claim submission. And I've learned through this series that other states have already been able to do this. So I would love to see that in Massachusetts and beyond. Um, this entity should have a larger capability to speak with doulas that have questions and um, excuse me, that have questions about claim submissions and denials to avoid excessively high weight and response times, which can be a deterrent um, to newly credentialed doulas. Um, also, the last solution for the future I have is changes to the CMS 1500 or relinquishing the CMS 1500 for claim submission, which might sound crazy, but hear me out. So, a more interactive CMS 1500 um, within the provider platform would be great. Currently, most sites um, on the form, when you submit a claim, it will check the claim to see if the necessary information is there, and it will say that the claim is okay, but the claim can still be denied, denied. and I can see that being misleading for someone who doesn't normally process claims. And then when a claim is denied, the denials are unclear sometimes. Um, they, it will come back with a denial code as well as some language that's pretty elusive. And even I, someone who has experience with submitting claims, need I need to look up what the denial means sometimes. Um, I think the best and most helpful claim submission route would be to relinquish the use of the CMS 1500. Um, so, for example, if you've ever submitted a insurance claim for an out-of-network service, you will probably fill out a claim form. It has more simple language and it doesn't require any ICD-10 codes. So the simple language will be great. And then the ICD-10 codes are not doula specific yet. So doulas could potentially submit this form and the payer will be able to use the coding that they see fit. Next slide. So this is a quote from James Clear. Hello to all my atomic habits people. <laughs> so it just says, you do not rise to the level of your goals, you fall to the level of your systems. And I just wanted to leave you with this. And most importantly, thank you for all of the impactful work that you're doing. Thank you for learning more about a company doula care and listening to me today. Thanks so much. Wow. Thank you so much, Julie. And thank you all for these, not just engaging presentations, but for being so concrete with the information you're sharing, um, the feedback you're giving, and the roadmap that you're helping to create for moving forward. So there's so much to compare and contrast in terms of the design and the implementation from each of these state and program contexts. Now uh, we'd like to move over to our um, moderated conversation. We've heard a lot at this point about the challenges that doulas face first in meeting the requirements for becoming a Medicaid reimbursable provider and also then for actually billing and getting paid for providing services. Each of you has experience with different models of credentialing, contracting, payment structures, um, and so in your experience, I would love to hear what is the number one administrative burden to tackle and overcome for doulas and perinatal community health workers? 
And what do state Medicaid agencies really need to prioritize in order to facilitate the implementation of this work? Um, so I'd like to hear from each of you. Julies, could we start with you, please? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think the number one administrative burden is claim submission. Um, from my presentation, you may be able to tell that. Um, a claim specialist is a full position and we shouldn't expect one person to manage their actual job as a doula as well as other aspects that are meant for more people. Um, and in my presentation, I suggested a simplified claim form and uh, that would be the best way to overcome for doulas. Thank you, that's super helpful. Um, Iris, what have you learned from Oregon? Yeah, I think uh, one of our biggest challenges is really uh, getting doulas uh, certified with the state. So there's um, complicated paperwork. You have to not only be trained, but know how to get uh, CPR trained, uh, take the oral health training that's online. Um, you have to, you know, really figure out your experience in terms of the birth you've attended, if that meets the requirements. Uh, there's a background check, uh, which not everyone can pass. And so really thinking about simplifying the rules, um, making sure that they are clear and that there are tools to um, really share that information about what the rules uh, entail out into the community, whether that's FAQs or live webinars, um, but really ensuring that the community of doulas understands the process um, because it's clear. Thank you so much for that. Um, and from Health Connect One and New Jersey, Sean Vey, do you want to take this one? Uh, yeah. So one of the, the biggest problems that we've seen is just the credentialing process in itself, or specifically contracting with managed care organizations. An example is that in New Jersey, there are five different managed care organizations. Each of their applications is different. One of them has an application that is about 45 to 50 pages. Another application has narrowed it down to about two or three. Um, so what we've seen a lot of organizations do is they just take a traditional provider application and they just pass it out to doulas and slap us, like, hey, here you go, you, you go ahead and fill this application. The problem is, and it doesn't speak at all to the intelligence level of doulas, um, but there will be, you know, when you have a medical provider that you know that they've gone through a certain amount of schooling and they have a hospital system backing them to sign these contracts and do these things. But when you have a doula, do not have the same level of edu education and they may have a high school GED or they may have a PhD. You don't know, they come from all walks of life, but expecting everyone to fill out the same application um, and not making any exceptions, um, that's usually, it's, it's pretty complicated. And we run into a lot of issues where they just don't understand the language. Um, even sometimes we've asked them to simplify their glossary that has defined definitions in it. Well, can you at least do a simplified glossary if you don't want to do a doula specific um, application? And we've gotten a lot of pushback with MCO saying, no, you know, that, that takes too much work. It means we have to change the, the national application. So they've just got to filter through it and, you know, figure it out. Um, and it really is a DEI issue um, just because at the end of the day, you can't recruit from a pool of folks that, you know, are also Medicaid recipients and you would only send them out um, member facing material at a certain like, grade level um, and then want them to go in and, and fill out something that they need a PhD to fill out it, you know, make it make sense. It doesn't. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. I think that really feeds nicely into the next question. Um, Joni, could you talk a little about how does the support that the New Jersey Doula Learning Collaborative um, provides, how does that facilitate the success of the benefit in New Jersey? And how does that differ from your experience in other states? Meeting is helpful. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, just a little bit of backstory. Um, so the New Jersey DLC, it is a collaboration between the New Jersey Department of Health and the Office of the First Lady. And it's under the Nurture New Jersey Initiative to be able to build the workforce and train doulas, but also to address the maternal um, crisis that's happening for Black and Brown birthing people. So we also do train 
um, provide training. We've launched the GAINS uh, training for New Jersey or the PCHW. And we also provide the technical assistance piece, which I think is very key because we essentially doula, doula, doula the doula. I'm getting very excited. Um, so we lift the administrative burden, which we've all talked about a lot, um, and provide that peer-to-peer -peer support in filling out the application. We weeded through the questions that even confuse us, and we work in this space with various MCOs. So understanding where the hiccups may lie down the road, which now, once we've addressed that, we can provide the peer-to-peer -peer support even during office hours. We have office hours twice a week um, when we see everyone who can come in um, and then we're able to do that and provide that space for them. And I think that's also where in different states that um, so, so to speak, quote unquote, safe space is not there for doulas to have peer to peer support. That's a huge benefit. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Iris, since Oregon was one of the first states to create a birth doula Medicaid billing pathway over 10 years ago now, what advice would you give to other states that are just starting their journey? What have you learned through that Oregon journey? Yeah, I think um, there's a couple things to consider. And I think there's um, advice I would give to uh, state governments, MCOs, CCOs, uh, which is uh, expand your table, invite doulas to participate resource them to participate. Others have said this too, pay people to come and give you their expertise on, on their work. They will tell you uh, what they need. And so listen and then take action. So really, you know, if you are, if you are creating a policy, a rule about doula Medicaid reimbursement, uh, number one, you, you've just got you've got to invite doulas to the table. The other thing, you know, for the doula community, I would recommend, uh, is come together, network with one another, learn what other doulas are doing in other parts of your state, create an association, create a collective or a collaborative of some kind where you're getting to know each other uh, and come to places of power with one voice. So if you're able to come together and, and talk about, gosh, you know, our rate is too low. Um, this is complicated. We don't understand it. We need to capacitate our, our training entities to offer more scholarships, whatever that is, come together and, and, and strategize that uh, and, and then go to those uh, t tables of power and, and policy to really make those uh, recommendations. Thank you for that. Um, next, Julie, I'd love to hear from you. What is the role of a community-based organization um, in this process, an organization like a company doula care that can really support doulas working with health plans and why is the organizational structure so important for uh, the doulas and making sure that they can actually do the work, do the billing and making sure that implementation of the benefit is successful. Yeah, so I would echo Iris in bringing doulas to the table. We are an organization of doulas and doulas need to be part of the decision-making process. Um, so in regard to support from our organization, in my role, I provide doulas with admin and billing support. And then there's the community aspect within a company. So we have a pretty lively WhatsApp chat for all of our doulas and they're there in real time asking each other questions about how they can best support their clients. Um, they, if they're in a situation where they've pulled all, all of their tricks out of the bag and nothing is working, they can get to the end result that they need to with the help of their peers. And then uh, we also have the support of our doula supervisor and our program manager to the doulas. Um, they are speaking to doulas after almost every birth. And whether the birth was beautiful and empowering or if it was traumatic, it's a lot of emotional baggage for one person to carry. So those conversations that uh, Luce and Diana are having with doulas are a place to vent and a place to relate. Um, they're lessening the mental load and the organizational structure is important because at the end of the day, a doula doesn't have to wear 10 hats. They just do their job. They come and they doula. 
So important, thank you. Um, so in response to feedback from the last couple of sessions, we want to allow a little more time for questions from the learning series participants. If you haven't already, please continue to submit your questions and we'll work to share written responses to questions that we're not able to address live on the webinar today. So for starters, um, either Joni or Sean Vey, uh, we have a question. What are the pros and cons for doulas of using support service providers or vendors to deal with the administrative and operation structures that they may not individually have in place? So I think obviously the pro is definitely that lift of administrative burden. Um, most doulas or, or most people don't have time to take an, an entire additional course. I know the Medicaid billing course that I went through when I was younger, you know, you don't have months to go through that course. So not having to do that type of work just in order to be able to run your own business, that's obviously always a pro anytime you can simplify it. Um, as far as a con, if the, depending on the type of service is the cost. Um, so, you know, providers, traditional providers, these billing services sometimes are billing at a cost that's for traditional providers, which their pay scale is much higher. So the cost is much higher because they're giving them the same rate. There's usually no necessarily doula discount. I know one platform or one service that we utilize, um, we utilize a platform called the Doula Network, which is a national provider of billing services for doulas. And it's literally only for doulas, not for any other providers. Um, as a, a billing clearinghouse, and you'll be able to document in that platform that will feed directly into billing. Um, that's one of the best systems that I've seen that's able to be used. And the cost, um, it's, it's very cost effective. It's a very low cost as compared to many of the other platforms that I've seen with utilizing an outsourced billing agency. Thank you for that. Um, do others wanna address that or shall we move on to the next? All right. Uh, Iris, this one's for you. In Oregon, is there a requirement for liability coverage for doulas? And if so, how is this handled? Yeah, really good question. Um, it is a requirement for contracting with a CCO to have liability insurance. Um, so part of the technical assistance that I offer doulas through the process um, is giving them information about where to go. Um, to get that liability insurance. Um, most doulas find that it's about $100 to $300 a year, uh, and they would you know, just need to print out uh, proof of that insurance as they are credentialing with us um, through that contracting process. So um, I have had some doulas where they say, well, gosh, I need to wait for my next paycheck in order to um, get liability insurance before I can move on to the next process. But um, for most, it's, it's a... Um, it's a function of their of their professional um, business that they feel like uh, is important, not just for us as, as, as a contracting entity, but for them as um, professional doulas. So um, it is a requirement, but not, not a big hurdle that I've found. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, Julies, we have a question for you. What are a company's best practices for recruiting and hiring an international group of doulas? Yeah, so we don't necessarily recruit. The doulas do come to us. So it's really word of mouth um, from other doulas who have worked with us and people in the community, honestly. Excellent, thank you. That's one of the benefits of being, um, while, the org while a company doula care is newer. I know that a lot of the folks you're working with have been working as doulas and coordinating related projects and programs uh, in the state. And it's one of the things I think that's really important to recognize about the experience of people who've been working as community-based doulas and perinatal community health workers for a long time. They have built those relationships and they've seen a lot of the issues and problems and developed experience um, dealing with, with all of that and built the relationships to bring in really wonderful um, people to provide the services. So the next question is for everybody. What experiences do you have working with hospital systems? 
to accept and work with doula services? And how does this affect the administrative side of things? Who wants to tackle that one? Great. Uh, Sean Vey. Uh, so we actually, um, through Health Connect One, we have worked on a, the Rochester Doula Hub, which is in upstate New York, Rochester, New York, um, to build a system with, um, and it's actually two different hospital systems, um, URMC and, and RH, Rochester Regional Health, um, and just tackling that to be able to work within two hospital systems to accept doula care and doula practices. It, it was a large scale project. Uh, one of the most effective things that we saw was when we implemented the community-based doula program, we first initially had a community convening where we invited administrators, social workers, um, nurses, all to a meeting to let them know this is what a doula is. This is the scope of work. This is what the doulas will be doing. So it's not like strangers are coming into your hospital and taking over because you usually find that's the fear. What are they doing? What are they doing here? They're going to interfere. Um, and then we continued to have these meetings. So we actually spoke at their grand rounds to make sure that we had points of contact with the nursing staff and who's actually on the floor. Um, and then we had them appoint each system, appointed a liaison, and we had quarterly updates. So if we had a doula that said, hey, I had an access issue and I wasn't able to get in, what can you do? Um, we brought those issues at those quarterly meetings within the hospital system to their specific point person and liaison. And also one of the best things that we asked them to do was we had them create doula badges. So the doulas didn't have to go and show my certification. Who are you? Why are you here? I'm a doula. I'm here. Just walk right in, walk through security. So you don't have to, who are you visiting? Where are you going? I'm a doula. I'm here to support and I'm going in. And that eliminated a lot of the burden that we saw. Um, and that also alleviated a little bit of the administrative um, burden just because they weren't constantly fighting and making phone calls um, just to handle all of these issues. And that piece is such a simple solution. Thank you for sharing all of that. Um, Iris and Julie's. Do you want to add anything from experience in your states? Sure, I can add something just briefly. Um, yes, we have several hospitals who have um, doula-based programs. Uh, some have different models than others. I myself have been uh, a part of supporting a couple of hospitals in thinking about uh, um, contracting with the CCO, um, with Medicaid. Um, but also subcontracting with the community-based doulas in the community to then, as you mentioned, have a badge that the hospital recognizes um, uh, to come into the hospital and provide those services. But then because of that contract with the hospital, then the hospital bills on their behalf. So again, reducing that administrative burden. Um, and that's become really successful. Uh, a few hospitals came to me kind of asking for some technical assistance around that. I really believe the importance of capacitating a program coordinator um, that's you know within the hospital to support um, kind of again liaising between that health system and the community-based doulas. But I think um, that model of having a community-based doula network that the hospital can refer to um, is really important and keeps the work in the community. Thank you, Julie. Did you want to answer that same? question? Um, no, thank you. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so the next one, the next question is for Joni and Sean Vey. What are some examples of effective needs assessment models or baseline research that you all recommend? And how does this help later in the process of operationalizing Medicaid coverage for doulas and perinatal community health workers? Um, so I'll go first and Joni, I'll let you jump in. Um, so with a effective environmental needs assessment, um, I, I refer back to that slide, but seeing how many births you actually need to support. I think with one state, they were like, oh, we're going to serve this many clients, but they didn't realize like I need in order to support 50,000 births a year, I need at least 3,600 doulas working full time to support so see how many births do you actually need to support? How many doulas do you actually need? Is that, how are you gonna build that to you know, build capacity? What training programs are in place? When you think about um, you know, most training programs, national training programs have a directory. You can easily do a simple Google search and see there's only about 75 doulas that are practicing here. We, you know, we might need to do a little bit more. Um, so that's definitely like as far as baseline figuring out how many folks you need to um, serve 
um, who's working in the community and, and what's their capacity. Um, and Joni, I'll, I'll pass it on to you if you have anything else to add. Yeah, that was great. Um, two points also I would add is what area do you want to serve? Like get very, very niche and specific. What area do you want to serve? And also to start to build and talk about equitable compensation for the PCHWs or CHWs and doulas in the area. What is the socioeconomic status of the members and also the doulas in the area? What's the going rate? We can talk about national versus local level as well. Thank you so much. So for our final question, I'd just love to hear from each of you, um, again, and a little bit more specifically than what we've talked about before, how can we best support small community-based doula agencies and collectives that might not have the IT infrastructure, the administrative software, or systems to support legal and HIPAA requirements? Um, how can you support the small community-based organizations or agencies in implementation? Um, and Julie, maybe we could start with you. Yeah, so I absolutely love what Oregon is doing um, in regard to the HubSpot. That is a, like amazing innovation, and I think that our state could benefit from it as well. Um, but as far as other aspects, um, so I believe that Medicaid should provide the training. I'm sorry, I just lost my train of thought. Oh, that's all right. You can move on. All right, do you wanna maybe raise your hand when you wanna? Yes. Come back. Okay, um, Iris, do you wanna go next? Yeah, just to piggyback on that, I, I think, uh, you know, health systems should be responsible for helping support small community-based organizations um, in uplifting their systems. So, you know, whether that's training around HIPAA requirements uh, or, or even help support the funding of um, new IT systems, uh, you know, we, we won't have perinatal equity if we don't have doulas, and we won't have doulas unless big health systems are really resourcing those uh, in that infrastructure. Thanks so much. And uh, Health Connect One. Um, so I concur with uh, both of their thoughts. Definitely um, health system supporting, um, Medicaid itself supporting, um, actually providing funding to these organizations. That's the biggest thing. They can't do it. They need help. Someone to come in and teach them how to do it, provide them funding specifically for that to help them build the structure. Once they build the structure and infrastructure, they can really hit the ground running with it, but you've got to give them the tools. So providing them the funding and the tools to actually do that work and move forward um, is one of the, the best ways that I can think of. Last words, Julie. <laughs> Thank you all for putting words to my thoughts because these are exactly what I wanted to say. So thanks again. Um, but yes, I believe that Medicaid should be providing the funding. And if they don't, if they aren't able to provide the funding, they could also identify the resources. So grants that can be applied for and anything else that would help. Thank you. That's so helpful. Um, and Joni, anything you want to add? I feel like it was said so succinctly, so nothing to add, but thank you for this. It was beautiful. Perfect. Thank you, all of you, for your words of wisdom, bringing your experience to the table. I think, you know, there's so much that we can do moving forward to just keep strengthening this process and make sure that implementation goes smoothly, is improved, so we can all ensure greater uptake of this evidence-based variety of support for the people who really need it and will benefit. So Yanti, over to you. Thank you all. Thank you so much for all of these presentations the discussion. I can tell that everyone was super excited about these conversations through all of the questions in the chat. Just wanna remind everyone that we were not able to get to all the questions, but we will definitely be providing answers to these questions in our um, FAQ document that will be sent out about two weeks after this, um, not after today. Um, so we would love for you all to fill out the survey that will be added in the chat. Um, it is just, it'll take three minutes. Um, if you didn't, 
not received the email, please contact me. My email is listed on the slide. Um, the survey was also sent out in the email. Um, and the link is also in the chat. Um, finally, all the materials will be, including the recording, will be made available to you on the IMI website in two weeks. And session four of the doula and perinatal community health workers in Medicaid learning series is called State Level Efforts of Implementation and will be on Thursday, March 2nd at 3 p.m. Eastern time. Keep an eye out for the pre-session email with the agenda and required pre-session activities. And if you haven't already, please remember to add um, Dr. Jennifer Moore to your email contact list to ensure that the emails are not sent to your spam. Um, her email is also on the slide. We want to thank everyone for your participation and engagement today in our session, and we look forward to seeing you at session number four on March 2nd. Thank you so much.